in the blink of an eye, Alabama turned into a very beatable football team. You're talking about Tennessee, led by Jarrett Garantano, possibly the worst quarterback in the SEC. <laughs> Almost made this a one-score game Just bash late him. in the fourth is, quarter. Is coaching and bashing enough? They'll drew I mean, has to come hold and put the it phone. On this was unbelievable. This is Campus Floor Live, where NFL players are the experts on college football. I'm your host. Drew Butler joined alongside Aaron Murray. And, Aaron, week eight is over. We're heading into week nine of the 2019 college football season. And on this episode of Campus Floor Live, we are joined by Devin White from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and LSU and Jerry Tillery, Los Angeles Chargers and Notre Dame alumni. A lot to talk about. These two teams obviously playing extremely well. And they've got big top 25 matchups coming up this weekend. A lot happened last weekend, which sets up an important week nine and one team that needed a win in the worst way because they have a bye week coming up to set up a huge divisional rivalry game the florida gators in the southeast had to deal with a lot of weather it was pouring down in columbia when they played the gamecocks were they lucky to get away with the win or do you think that they did just what it took well that's a tough place to play you and i both know that south carolina is one of the toughest environments and those fans were excited going back they had a huge win the week before versus georgia Florida's coming off a tough road loss to LSU. So you want to talk about momentum, and momentum is real in college football. Week to week, within a game, South Carolina has all of it. Florida was kind of yeah. you know, banged up a little bit, especially on the defense side of the football. Bad weather, sloppy. You know, it was a, a Peyton Manning type game. Spirals were optional. You just, <laughs> you know, you just weren't gonna sure. throw. You weren't gonna throw many spirals. Uh, weren't a lot of pretty balls. But it, the most important thing to me was. Once again, Kyle Trask got it done. For sure. And that, that's so impressive because it was, like I said, it was sloppy. You saw him in the first the first half mostly kind of not in complete control of the ball, of, of where it was going, had the interception. And then second half, he just started rolling a little bit. The weather got a little bit nicer. His confidence started getting going and had four touchdowns. And, and really, every single week that he's been the starter, even when he, when he, when he came in, when Felipe got hurt, he's just getting better and better. He's getting more confidence. And I think the guys around him are confident. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. As a quarterback, it's not always about you, but do you make those guys around you feel better when you're under center? And I think, I, I, I promise you, the offensive line does, the running backs do, the receivers do, the defense does, the coaching staff does. I think everyone feels that energy. And, and they're believers. They're believers in their coach. They're believers in their quarterback, the scheme, and, and, and the fact that they may be right now the best team in the East. And, and, and honestly, I would put them up against Alabama and LSU, and wow. I think they could compete. Really? They, could, they were winning versus LSU in the third quarter, 28-21. And we went over the game last week, some kooky calls, some kooky decisions by Dan Mullen. Tough place to play. If you put this Florida team right now on a neutral site, I'm not saying they're going to win. I'm not saying they're not okay. winning. Okay. I'm saying it would be a very competitive game versus both Alabama and LSU. Okay. I think they're that good right now. Let's not forget, when before Felipe Franks got hurt, they were going to lose at Kentucky. Yes. I mean, they were going to lose that game. Kyle Trask comes in. He's taken over. For a guy that had never played a road college game, stepping into the Kentucky atmosphere, playing pretty well for a half of football against LSU, and then throwing four touchdowns at Williams-Brice Stadium. We talked to Farrell Cooper last week about how hard of a place that is to play. That's pretty significant, and you just said it. He's giving that coaching staff a lot of confidence, which may be the most important thing. Florida beats South Carolina 38-27. Bye week this week. Georgia has a bye week as well. That's going to be an important yep. world's largest outdoor cocktail party. We can still call it that. One team that continues to backtrack, although they win, 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 is Clemson. The Clemson Tigers, you're defending national champions. They win this past weekend. They beat up on Louisville 45-10, to and yet... Ohio State jumps them in the poll. That's the second week in a row Clemson's taken a backseat. Is that just because of their schedule, their strength of schedule? Well, I think it's the way they're winning, too. Yeah. I mean, go back to last year, Ohio State. You know, they're winning football games, but they weren't They weren't sexy. They weren't dominant all the time. And I think for, for this team, people look to Trevor Lawrence. You automatically look to the quarterback. How is the quarterback playing? If he was playing better, this team would be the number one team in the nation. Great defense, yeah. great run game, great receivers. It's just... For him, the, the, the sophomore slump is real. Yeah. It really is. You look at some of those picks that he had early in that game versus Louisville, it, they were not the mistakes he was making last year. I mean, he made very few mistakes last season. So the thing about this team is, like we say every week, they're going to get in. They're the best team in the ACC. There's no one in that conference can challenge them. And two, at any given day, 
they are just as talented as anyone in the country, maybe more talented than anyone in the country when it comes to a full, complete team. Great defense, one of the best defenses in the country. Mm -hmm. And like I said, a great running back, great receivers, and a quarterback that can just, if, if he can just figure it out and just get it going just a little bit, this could be the best team in the country. They really could be. And, and, and they're going to have a chance because they will get in the playoffs. And then any given day, they can be anyone else. Do style points matter for Clemson or the fact that they're defending national champions carry them into the college football playoff regardless of how they beat up on the ACC? Because as it looks right now, that ACC championship game is not going to be much to worry about for the Tigers. Even though they lost so much on the defensive line last year, a ton of first-round talent, Trevor Lawrence and that offense, they've got plenty of playmakers. Are they just going to win out and get yeah, in? Or they, they they're going to win out and get okay. in. I don't think it matters. I mean, if they do stumble, which, I mean, we saw versus North Carolina, they had that one scare. I don't anticipate that yeah. the rest of the season. So they will win out, and they'll get in 13-0. And, and, and like I said, they'll have, they will have every opportunity based on the talent they have on that football team and the coaching staff, great defense coordinator, great offensive staff. To, to, to really scare anyone else in the country. One team that's going to need a lot of help to get into the college football playoff, even though they have one respectable loss, is out of the Pac-12, and that's Oregon. Oregon beat Washington this past weekend, 38-34. to Washington, a top 25 team. This game was in Seattle, so a great road win for Justin Herbert and the Oregon Ducks. And Mario Cristobal, head coach for the Ducks, is really kind of building this team like an SEC team. Yep. Great offense and defensive line, solid quarterback play, and getting tough road wins when they need it. I wonder how much that loss to Auburn is going to hurt them at the end of well, the season. Well, it could hurt them based on what goes wrong in the country. Obviously, if you have four other conferences with undefeated teams. They're they're on the outside looking in. Yeah. So they're really hoping. I mean, they're cheering for Wisconsin. They're cheering that somehow Texas or whoever faces Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship game wins that game. But right now, Oregon looks pretty darn good. For sure. I mean, that game was awesome to watch. Jacob Eason yeah. was flinging all over the place. Justin Herbert, quarterback for Oregon, was flinging all over the place. I mean, that was, if you're a fan watching that game, and it was a 12 o'clock game, so most people could watch it, that was two NFL quarterbacks going at no it. No doubt. I mean, that, that, that was potentially two first round picks just doing it out, post routes, go balls, slants, digs. I mean, everything that these scouts want, they got to see in that football game. And it was fun for me to watch just loving quarterback play. But right now, I think you said it best, Drew, they have everything in the recipe to get into the playoffs when it comes to the talent and, and the style points and playing in a conference that has good football teams. It's just, it stinks the fact that they lost the game they should have won. They really did. They, they, they should have beat Auburn. They were winning for the majority of the football game. They, they, they dropped points when they put up, should put some more points on the board. Yeah. Lucky thing for them, though, it was the first game of the year. And, and also, Auburn's playing well. So I think they're kind of rooting for Auburn to continue to, to win and have success to make that loss look a little bit better. Yeah, and a lot of teams that are ranked ahead of them are going to beat up on each other. So if Oregon keeps taking care of business, they have to go to USC and at Arizona State. Hopefully they win those couple of games, win the Pac-12, and then they just wait and see. Yep. We will see what happens. They're not undefeated, though. That's what hurts them yep. the most. A couple of teams that are undefeated that could be big surprise towards the end of the season are teams like Minnesota in the Big Ten, Baylor in the Big 12, App State, a group of five team that's looking pretty good, and the Southern Methodist Mustangs, they look pretty good as well. A lot of transfer help with the Mustangs, which is I, important. I think SMU has been the most impressive. Just I think so, too. Based on their schedule, I mean, Minnesota really hasn't played anyone. They still have to play the big boys in their conference. And same with Baylor. I mean, they're undefeated, but prove it to me a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and really, Minnesota. Minnesota you, has not yeah, played anybody. Prove it to me against the elite, top, elite competition. SMU is not going to play the big boys, but based on their schedule, they beat Temple. And they beat Which is a great win. Temple's defense is legit. It's a great football yeah. team right there. And then they still have to play Navy. They have some tough, some tough games in their conference. But right now, really, really exciting offense. Great quarterback, great running, running back. And uh, they've been fun to watch. But all those teams, I mean, obviously, if, you're, if you are undefeated at this point in the season, you're doing something right. Um, so congratulations to them. No I doubt. think SMU right now, to me, has been the most impressive. Yeah, but watch out for App State. South Carolina has been so up and down all season. If they can knock off South Carolina, which is a huge task. Which is South Carolina paying them? I don't know, but that will be an interesting game. And that's a team right there could, who could fight for yeah. a New Year's Six Bowl game as the top group of five teams. How funny is that? I mean, you, you look at your schedule to start a season off. And, and you kind of look at it like, and I would too. I would look at it like, hey, that's a, that's a five touchdown Absolutely. game. Absolutely. That's a six touchdown game. That's, you know, that, that's the game you kind of pat your stats and, you know, make yourself look good. 
And and now South Carolina's like, damn, man, we're about to play a team that could actually beat us. And this no is question. A, Undefeated, too. A stat padding game, and it might not happen. Absolutely. You have that much confidence if you're App State to go into South Carolina and look at what they've done earlier in the season when they weren't playing that well. They're going to have a lot of opportunity. Speaking of games that you might look at on the schedule to pad your stats, Wisconsin probably did that last week against Illinois before the Ohio State game, which is coming up this weekend. Were they in trouble? I don't know, but they turned the ball over, yep. missed a field goal inside 40 yards late in the third quarter, and they lose. And I was just pumping them up like crazy last week, saying they were the best team in the nation. It's, it stinks because I, mean, I was so looking forward to two undefeated teams. I think at the end of the day, and we'll, and we'll break this down later on, this is still going to be an incredible football game, but it, it, it's your classic look ahead game. That's all it is. It, it's you're looking ahead to the big game everyone's been talking about for weeks now. I mean, it's not like it's been like one or two weeks. I mean, the entire, almost the entire season, people have been talking about Wisconsin and Ohio State and how yeah. much this game's going to mean to to the landscape of college football. And 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 they saved Lovey Smith's job pretty much. I mean, Lovey I mean, Smith really was on the hot seat. All of a sudden, they win that game in that fashion. But it comes to turnovers, mental mistakes, something that Wisconsin has not done all year. Interception late, fumble late. Jonathan Taylor never fumbles the football. I know. And he puts it on the ground. I mean, stuff Horrible like that. Horrible interception by Jack Cohn yeah, late it, in the game. It, it, it's, it's stuff like that. That, like I said, it, it is a classic. We're just we're not focused. We are expecting to show up and just win based on the fact that we we put our uniforms on. Yes. And that's it. Yeah. And, and it doesn't always happen like that. I mean, shoot, we went to uh, Vandy my senior year, and we were banged up though. I mean, we we just lost half our freaking. Offense. I was not there. Yeah. I was not there. <laughs> Drew was not there. We <laughs> lost half our offense the week before to. Uh, I do remember to Tennessee, that Tennessee. To yeah. ACL injuries because that stupid crown. And, and and we just played awful. I remember before the game, Bubble came up to me, and and in and, and nice terms, I'm not going to say exactly what Bubble said. This is a not show allowed. for children. <laughs> and he's like, "You better get your boys ready because you guys aren't ready to play this football game." Yeah, that's and not, you, not what you want to hear. That's yeah. not what you want to hear from your OC before the game. But it was true. I mean, we were not ready to play that football game, and we lost. I mean, we still should have won at the end. Some crazy stuff. The referees kind of mess with us a little bit, but yeah, excuses, yeah, that tends excuses. to happen. We lost to Vandy on the road. We were looking ahead to the rest of our schedule. Yeah, that was the first top 10 win for Illinois since they beat number one Ohio State in 2007 and the biggest upset in the Big Ten since Northwestern beat Minnesota in 1982 as a 32-point underdog. Wisconsin was a 30-point favorite. Good for them, though. Okay. They have a chance for a quick bounce-back game heading to Columbus to take on Ohio State. Quickly, before we head to break, Tua Tungabailoa, Alabama, gets injured. High ankle sprain, was out of the game. In comes Mac Jones, the backup quarterback. In the blink of an eye, Alabama turned into a very beatable football team. You're talking about Tennessee, led by Jarrett Garantano, possibly the worst quarterback in the SEC. <laughs> Almost made this a one-score game Just bash late him. in the fourth is, quarter. His coach didn't bash him enough. No, Drew I has mean, to come hold the phone. This was unbelievable. Could not believe what I was watching. I was actually laughing at the TV. And my wife, who went to Alabama, says, what are you laughing? And I go, I've never seen Alabama look like this. Not that I can remember. It was pretty insane. Tua better get healthy because November 9th, they're playing LSU, and that game could get very interesting. Well, lucky for them, it's at Alabama, and the refs are going to be, oh, you know. Whoa. Because, I mean, we were going over this before the show. I mean, some of those calls were. Calls? Well, phantom calls? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the push off the quarterback wasn't the, what was it, the, the, the referee stopped the clock because Alabama seemed to be confused about what was <laughs> yeah, going on. It's unbelievable. The, the pass that went five yards and no time went off the clock. You're just like. You know, what, what's going on here? And, and honestly, Tennessee could have made this game a lot closer. No question. I mean, you take away that penalty, that's two three and outs in a row for Alabama, and then if, if they're able to score inside the red zone a couple times, I mean, this game, I'm not saying Tennessee would have won. It would have been a one-score game with seven one minutes left game. in the and, fourth quarter. And you quarter. don't know. I mean, Alabama looked, looked lost. Average loss. Yeah. The Confused. backup quarterback couldn't do much. I mean, it's going to be interesting. He, he's... He has opportunity now to, to, to take all the reps for Arkansas, but don't sleep on Tua's brother here. Little Tua may get some reps. Talia. Talia may get some reps. Um, the younger brother of Tua Tagovailoa, yeah. freshman at Alabama, may get some reps in this week's game. And high ankle sprain, he just had surgery uh, to help kind of speed up the process, but he's literally not going to be able to do anything for seven to ten days. Yeah. He's out, and then he'll kind of start slowly working back into it. And I think the biggest issue is, is we saw him in, in Atlanta, as he changed the game last year, last year, and he wasn't 100, percent and he did not look very. good. He gets affected pretty quick. So if, if he's not 100 percent versus LSU, 
Watch out. Watch out. This it could, could be a be, fun game. This could be, could a fun be one. pretty interesting. Speaking of LSU, our next guest, our first guest, is going to be Devin White, LSU Tiger and current Tampa Bay Buccaneer. We will be sure to ask him about what he thinks is going to happen in Tuscaloosa in just a couple weeks. We'll be right back after the break. Come join us with Devin White. This is Campus Lore Live. Welcome back into Campus Lore Live, Drew Butler, Aaron Murray, and we are joined by our first guest now. It's Devin White, former LSU Tiger, current Tampa Bay Buccaneer. Devin was a two-time All-SEC linebacker, a first-team All-American. He won the Buckus Award and was the fifth overall draft pick for the Buccaneers in the 2019 NFL Draft. Quite a resume you got there, Devin. Congrats on all your success. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's get right to it. Those LSU Tigers, man, the Bayou Bengals look legit. I want to ask you, as a defensive player, while you were in school, a lot of times at LSU, you weren't really known for great quarterback play and an explosive offense. How do you think that defense is feeling now down there when they know that they can lean on that offense to score 30-plus a game? You know, because I still talk to those guys that, you know, they they tie, they tie to getting, like, overlooked, overshined because, I mean, they kind of – Started off a little bad, you know, they was giving up a lot, but I feel like they're getting it together, you know, as the season progresses. And I mean, that's the major part. So if they just keep doing what they're doing, you know, they, they're going to be being uh, back to being that dominant defense that, you know, LSU is known for. Then now you got a great offense to uh, go along with it. I mean, the sky's the limit for them and they know it. So they just know they got to handle up on their end because the offense is doing their part. Devin, did you know last season that Joe Burrow could be this good? I mean, did he show flashes and – fall camp during the season we're like all right this this kid he stays another year he has the potential to be right now the Heisman favorite and in, in my mind I think the possibly top five pick in the NFL draft did you see that last year is this kind of a surprise to everyone I mean the stuff that he's doing now like making throws and stuff he made all those throws in practice and like he always showed like heart and that's one thing you know you can't give a player like just for instance when he was playing you you UCF in the uh, bowl game, and he got hit really hard, bloody nose, and get up and go back in and throw a dime, you know, for a touchdown. And I knew that was always that extra factor that he had that was going to give him get him over the hump. But, you know, we even said it as players, you know, like we, we're not giving our guys the opportunity to make plays. Like, you know, we still got a fullback in the game trying to run the ball, knowing in this day and age everything changed. But one thing Coach O did say was, you know, next year was going to be the year that he was going to find a way, whatever he had to do, so he can get those, you know, our playmakers in space. Because a lot of people don't realize, like, we had a number one recruiting class as far as receiver last year. Like, our true freshman, they was the number one receiving recruiting class in the country. And we really wasn't using those guys, you know. But, I mean, I knew Joe was going to be good. Because, I mean, he always showed it. He always made the passes. And then he did it coming into a team where everybody really wasn't, you know, on the same page with him because, you know, he was a transfer. But, you know, as I told everybody, man, he came here to make our team better. So you just got to salute him and tip your hat to him. You talk about Joe playing with a lot of heart, and I see your shirt. I know you're from Louisiana. I'm sure LSU holds a special place in your heart. Talk about your experience being an in-state recruit, going to LSU. I mean, it seems like that's the only choice or the, the number one choice for a lot of kids like yourselves, high talent in the state of Louisiana. You're a Louisiana kid, born and raised. You should always, you should always want to go to uh, LSU. I mean, there's nothing else that compares. You know, when I went there, I mean, it was the best. It was the best choice I ever made in my life. And if I can do it over again, I'll do it over again. And that's just because, like, I was loved. I got to run into Death Valley, which is ultimately like number one on my wish list. Growing up as a child, was running out of uh, Tiger Stadium with those guys, you know, behind the coach, you know, walking us out like we some, you know, caged in animals just ready to be released. And you know, just to do everything in front of the uh, my home state, that was man, I'm so glad. And I really didn't want to leave. I, I I hated that I had to leave, especially now seeing those guys had that much success, but. I'm just so happy for him, and I hope we can uh, pull it out, pull it out this year and win a natty. How tough is it not to laugh during a, a, a team meeting when Coach O gets up there and starts, you know, the Cookie Monster starts talking away? <laughs> I mean, the dude just every time I interview him, I'm just like holding it back, just not wanting to like laugh in his face. How fun is he? How fun is he as a coach? And and how entertaining is he when he speaks to you guys and and say a team meeting? 
was fun. I mean, he always just showed that, you know, he loved the state just as much as we do. So he want to do the things in order to get W's and stack them week in and week out. And I say the number one thing about Coach O, he's a player's coach. You know, he always takes our input. He always makes jokes. He don't try to be too serious. He don't try to get caught up in the moment. And, and that's the thing that if you're on the outside, you wouldn't get from him because once, you know, we run out that tunnel, he's a whole different coach over because it's business time. And, I mean, that's what you expect from the great coaches. And, you know, he want to be put with those guys so he know he got to win games. And, you know, but when you're in the meeting room, it's all fun. It's all jokes. And like you said, that voice. I mean, I got so used to it for being around him so long. But I know, like, it's only it's only hard and funny when he uh when he been hollering so long and his voice get hoarse and he barely can speak. And then he trying to holler. Like, that's, that's when it's the funniest. So, like, when we coming out of halftime and he's saying his little speech again, that's when it's the most funniest. That's great. I mean, LSU is known for putting so much talent into the NFL, just like yourself. There was a big debate a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago when you were playing Florida and then Texas, who's the real DBU? I mean, LSU could be LBU. They could be DLU. Seriously, they put – so much talent into the NFL. This year you got prospects like Grant Delpit, Jacob Phillips. I had the pleasure of playing with guys like Patrick Peterson, Tyron Matthew, Kevin Minner. What's it like having that much NFL talent on one team? Is everybody talking about it? Do you guys go there and make each other better because you want to succeed at such a high level to head into the NFL? I mean, I think the thing is, like, when you go to LSU, like, LSU prepare you for the NFL, and that's what a lot of guys – I always say is, you know, one of the main reasons why they come there, why they go to LSU is because they want to be pro ready. They want to, you know, be able to step into any organization in the NFL and fit right in. And and I can say that is the truth. Like, you know, everything we did at LSU, you know, we got, got treated like a pro professional. You know, we, we practice like professional, like, because we, we did the same type of periods, you know, schedule practice wise that the NFL players do. And that's something coach. Uh, Coach O implemented because he wanted us to be fresh. He wanted us to be, you know, be on our P's and Q's. He wanted us to, you know, be uh, film junkies and stuff. So, I mean, that's one thing that LSU do, and that's prepare you well. And then, even from the weight room standpoint, you know, Coach Tommy Moffitt, he's the best in business. You know, every uh, head strength coach you see around college football or even in the NFL, they come from under him. So, it let you know we got the best of the best. We talk about the NFL talent at, at LSU, and, and you see it every year like we just talked about. But – a game against Alabama, I mean, what is it a mental thing or what is it? And for you guys this year in LSU, is this the year that they finally break through? Because it's been a while since you guys have been those boys up in Tuscaloosa. Long time, but I say the thing that always boils down to us and them, they, they play harder for 60 minutes than what we do. You know, is and it's always going to be one or two players that decide that game. So it's, it's about who who's on their P's and Q's that game, who's not who's willing to not make a mental mistake, who's willing to know every play count, every snap count, you know, play every play like your last. And some teams you can play and you can mess up and you can get away with messing up, but that – uh, Alabama is just one of those teams that you that you don't get away with messing up when you're playing them. So every possession counts. But as far as uh, this year, man, I've been watching, you know, uh, our team mostly. I really don't watch their team, but I have been, you know, seeing like highlights and things and, you know, how many points they've given up and stuff. So I, I, I don't want it to be a shootout because it's always a defensive battle. But, I mean, I feel like it's going to be a high-scoring game, and I feel like we had a better defense this year, so I feel like we're going to pull it out. And then we play really well on the road, which is a good thing as well. I think the game's going to be over 70 points. I really do. I think it's going to be <laughs> an awesome football game. But you, know, you look at their offense with Tua and those receivers, and, and you played against them. How tough is it? Because you look all around. I mean, they, they, the same thing as you guys on defense. They have first-rounders everywhere at the offensive side of the football between Tua and uh, and all those speedy receivers that catch slants and just take them for touchdowns. How tough is it to face now all of a sudden these spread offenses? Because for so long for the SEC, it was, you know, the pro I, maybe two by two formations, and all of a sudden it spreads you out three by ones, five wides, mixing it up. And, and then you see all those speed that they have as well, the receiving position. How tough is it to face an offense like, like Alabama? Um, the thing that, they, that Alabama do really well on offense is the RPO game. Like, a lot of people don't run RPO, and they do it really well, especially last year because, you know, they had Damian Harris and Josh Jacobs. You know, uh, I really don't know what their uh, running game is like this year. I mean, obviously because those two guys departed for the NFL, but that was one of the things that kind of kept you off balance. You know, 
with uh facing to it because he can he can give it and they can get a lot of yards or he can pull it and they can hit you with a slant. And like you said, they got really great receivers in. So that means, you know, our defensive backs is going to have to be on their uh, A game as well. And and it's a game where they can make a name for themselves, you know, if they haven't already made a name for themselves. Like, for example, our cornerback, he, uh, he'll see you, uh, Christian Fortin. If he want to, you know, for sure himself and let the scouts know, hey, I'm the number one DB coming into this draft, this is the perfect game to uh, prove against because I know uh, Jerry Jude, I, I think he's probably the top wide receiver prospect back in the country and if he match up with him and he you know he handling his business it's an opportunity to showcase his skills and put him over the elite level and it's just one of those games you just got to look forward to dominate and i mean especially if you're on the uh, lsu side you know on defense it's a statement game for you so i mean i feel i feel like you know alabama they, they do what they do and they do it really well and i feel like one of the main things that help them out is their coach really well coach nick, nick saban does a great job Yes, he does. And in order to make that game as important as it can be, LSU is going to welcome in Auburn this weekend. Give me your prediction for this great SEC matchup. Auburn's top 10 on their own. What's going to happen this weekend in Death Valley? What's going to happen? Yeah. Green's going to die. Every time they come, every time they come to Death Valley, they get, they, they get beat. You know, uh, last, uh, last year we played them in Auburn. We beat them on late field goal. But the year uh, prior, my sophomore year, they was beating us by 20, made a halftime adjustment. Coach O gave a terrific speech that I hope it don't come to this year. And we came back and we beat them again. And uh, it was a great game. But this year, I think uh, Joe, Joe with him, how he playing, he on fire. Our receivers, and our whole offense, the way they playing, I don't think it'll be close. Because our defense, you know, what they just did against Mississippi State, they're going to build off that and they're going to shut them down. And then I seen that they quarterback saying, like, Death Valley wasn't nothing because he played against – uh, he played against uh, Oregon in, in a front of 100,000, but this this is more than 100,000. It's a different type of fan base. You talk about the, the fan base there, and it's it's one of the best in the country. Not your not your stadium in Death Valley, but what's the toughest place you ever played in the SEC? <laughs> I don't think no other place compares. I mean, I played at Alabama, but it it really wasn't as loud and. I played at LSU uh, my freshman year when Alabama beat us 10-0, and that's probably the loudest game I've ever been in. And it's really tough on the defense because they yelling so loud at Alabama offense that we can't even get you know get going where we got to get going because we can't hear nothing either. So I don't. It got to be LSU the toughest place to play. Like a road game for me never been too tough. Like, playing at Mississippi State, the Cowbells are annoying. That's about it. Like, <laughs> it ain't nothing tough about it. They just annoying. And, you know, playing at Alabama, I mean, it, it was loud, but it, it wasn't loud compared to LSU. You can certainly make the argument that LSU is the best team in the nation right now. Two huge games, two, two top ten games coming up in these next couple of weeks. And Devin White, we just want to say thanks so much for joining us. And next, we're going to be joined by another first-rounder from this past year and – Another Louisiana native, Jerry Tillery. That's right after the break. We'll see you right back here on Campus Lore Live. We are back, Campus Lore Live. Drew Butler, Aaron Murray. Big thanks to Devin White from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, former LSU Tiger, for joining us. Let's head to our next guest from Notre Dame and now with the Los Angeles Chargers defensive lineman, Jerry Tillery. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. Notre Dame is playing really good football so far in 2019. Yes, they do have one loss to Aaron and I's Georgia Bulldogs, but they look solid. They got a big game coming up this weekend, rivalry game at Michigan. And I'm going to ask you a question. You are from Louisiana, SEC country. What made you head up north to play football for the Fighting Irish? Well, when I, uh, when I was going through the whole – uh, you know, college recruiting process, I I would like to go and visit each school and see what each place was all about. And, uh, you know, I visited a bunch of different schools. And when I went to Notre Dame, that was really what I was looking for. And uh, it just, it, and it worked out for me. And, you know, I, I had an amazing time there. I know they have the whole independence thing going on right there at Notre Dame, but do you see any time in the future them joining, say, the ACC fully as a football team as well? I know they play a part of their schedule against ACC foes. 
But one, do you see it happening? And two, do you believe they should do it just to kind of help them out a little bit when it comes to, say, you know, trying to get back into the playoffs? No, I don't think so. I think with the schedules that Notre Dame plays every year, we're playing schools, you know, like, as you said, five from the ACC and other, you know, uh, opponents from Power Five conferences. Uh, who, you know, presents a difficult enough schedule. I think if we win all of our games, we, you know, deserve to be in the playoffs. So I think, uh, so I think that their current situation is really working for them. Uh, or us, I can still say us, yeah. uh, is working for us. And, um, and I think they don't, they don't have to change. We don't have to change. Speaking of that schedule, it seems like every single week, Whoever's playing Notre Dame really gets up for it. And Notre Dame has so many storied rivalries. Think about this weekend, heading to the Big House against Michigan. That is a great historical college football rivalry a couple of weekends ago. USC, you saw what that Georgia-Notre Dame game became with a home-and-home -home series in 2017 and then this past year in 2019. As an alumni, which game means the most to Notre Dame every season? I think, I mean, truly, as you said, since every – team that plays Notre Dame, uh, you know, is going to play their best game because everybody, uh, you know, respects, you know, the, the brand and, and the power that Notre Dame brings. So I have to say like every game that we play is, is the big game because, you know, uh, we play Bowling Green this year, you know, they, they had their dangerous team a couple years ago, boss, we played ball state and, you know, they made some plays on us. So we have to, uh, really, you know, play our best every week. And, uh, yeah, in every game, and that means that every game is a big one for us. Because of your independence and, and being able to play all these other schools and from other Power 5 schools, uh, you get to play in some really cool environments. You know, go out to USC and, and some other places. What, what was your number one place you played at while at Notre Dame? Uh, well, of course, the number one place is Notre Dame Stadium. But in terms of, uh, you know, other schools and what they bring, I think – when we played, uh, you know, in, in, at Clemson in a hurricane that night, you know, too, uh, that was probably, you know, the craziest environment I had been in. They had the place rocking there for sure. Notre Dame's coming off a bye week, heading to Ann Arbor to take on the Michigan Wolverines. And since Coach Kelly's been at Notre Dame, he is 8-1 following a bye week. Jerry, obviously you have been there for a couple of those wins. Tell me about how he manages that bye week to make sure that Notre Dame is fresh and ready to rock in the second half of the season. Uh, I think the way that we did it while we were there worked really well for us. It's a little bit unconventional uh, probably, but but what we would do is our bye week is usually scheduled when the university is off for a week for, uh, for fall break. So we're able to get a couple days to go home, you know, get out of South Bend to uh, kind of, you know, remove ourselves from Notre Dame football for a couple of days. And I think that uh, that, you know, grows everyone's passions and uh, everyone's, you know, at home fresh and we're able to come back, uh, you know, and, and attack this next week. So so that schedule is, is kind of what we did and it really worked for us. Jerry, before every game on Friday night, were you required to watch Rudy? Was that like a team? Uh, I mean, no, and how many times realistically did you watch that movie while they're at Notre Dame? Uh, I've seen it probably three times. Oh, okay. Three times. I love it. I love it. Yeah, movie. I've seen it probably I, 300 times. Yeah, I've seen it like over yeah. I, every season. I probably watch it at least once. It's the best. It is the best. It's fantastic. Drew, Drew Tranquil actually, uh, Drew Tranquil, he watched Rudy for the first time like like our senior year at, uh, at Notre Dame. Which is kind of hard to believe, but uh, but yeah, that that's that happened and that was kind of crazy. <laughs> it should be a requirement before really? you put the golden sure. dumb on your head. You have to watch that movie. Agreed. It is Agreed. absolutely all time. Speaking of all time, um, I'm sure Notre Dame would want to become national champion once again. They were in the college football playoff last year. They had that chance back in 2012 against Alabama. What's the expectation like at Notre Dame? at the beginning of the season. Is it national championship or bust? Are the goals to get to the college football playoff? Do you want to be undefeated? I know everybody says it, but is that really the goal at the onset of every season at Notre Dame? I mean, absolutely. I mean, we don't have a conference championship to play for, so 
every year we're playing for the playoffs and to uh, to win the national championship. That's our goal going to, into every season, and we understand uh, how much that means. And uh, and that's 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 the goal is you know national championship or bust, as you said. So Jerry, you, you were recruited as an offensive lineman, I believe, and made the transition to the defense side of the football. How tough was that? And have you used that kind of knowledge of playing offense to help you in your development on the defense side of the football? Yeah, definitely. I think having played the position long feels like a long time ago. I, you know, understand pass pass sets and I understand offensive line protections and uh, and what we're trying to defeat. So, uh, so I think that those skills definitely transferred as I as I moved out defensive line and found success there. All right, so the Fighting Irish are heading up to the big house this weekend. Coach Harbaugh needs a win in the worst way. Notre Dame needs to keep it rocking if they want any chance to get into the college football playoff. What's your prediction for this weekend and really for the rest of the season for Notre Dame? Uh, I like her chances in all of them. I think, uh, obviously, I think this this will be a big one. Uh, and um, if we beat Michigan, you know, at Michigan, at night, it's kind of a big big deal that they're doing it at night there. Uh I think it'll be a big win for us and as we make our case to make it to the college football playoffs. All right, you heard it here first. Jerry Tillery saying big weekend expected for Notre Dame and possibly finding a way into the college football playoff. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. And when we come back from break, we're going to be bold and then tell you what to expect from week nine. Jerry just told you Notre Dame. It will get on the board with a W. Come right back. Campus Lore Live. We are back. Big thanks to Jerry Tillery for joining us. And Aaron, it's time to get ready for week nine. But before we do that, we have to get bold. I mean, we are almost looking towards the college football playoff. It's crazy how fast this season's gone. And it's really about to get into hyper focus here. So tell me something. Be bold. Give me something in college football right now. So I, I know the identity of Georgia football is play great defense and yeah. run it. And, and yeah. the identity of LSU and Alabama three years ago play great defense and run it. And, and eventually you have to evolve a little bit. It just, it's just, it's the part of the football game. It's a part of what we're seeing nowadays when it comes to getting recruits, top quarterbacks, receivers, yeah. the excitement, give the people what they want to see. You know, watching that game and hearing people boo, I was like, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. So this is my be bold. If things continue along this path for Georgia's offense and it's just not successful the rest of the year and it's just kind of a, a speed bump after speed bump, Mike Bobo may not be the head coach of Colorado State next year. Okay. May not be. Okay. Maybe knocking on the door saying, hey, you know that old position I had when he used to score 35, 39 points a game, 40 points a game, whatever it was, one of the top offenses in the SEC? Well, hey, I'm free, and I'd like to be the OC again. <laughs> okay, calling his own shot. He's calling his own shot. I'd call my own shot too if I was Bobo. Yeah. So my OC, if he does get fired, I hope he doesn't. But if he does, OC of Georgia next year, there's a 92% chance. <laughs> oh, wow, throwing a percentage out there <laughs> as well. That is pretty bold because James Coley just hired a year ago, possibly one and done yeah. for him. But like you said, the evolution of offense is really across the nation Georgia's kind of playing that man ball, bully ball style defense run game, and it's just not really producing nope. at the rate that they'd want it right now. So Mike Bobo, possible offensive coordinator or, at Georgia or again. Or Joe Brady. Or Joe Brady. <laughs> you better bust out the checkbook yeah. if you want Joe Brady. <laughs> Speaking of coaches, and you just did, I'm going to tell you who my new favorite coach is in all of America. And it's a guy that I used to give an extremely hard time, but after what happened to his team this past weekend in Tuscaloosa, my bold statement to you is that Jeremy Pruitt of Tennessee is now my favorite coach in America because he is speaking out against the malpractice that is happening on a weekly basis from referees. That's right. If you watch that game on Saturday night, what was happening to Tennessee from ghost and phantom calls that refs were making, blowing the whistle when nothing was happening and Alabama's defense was lost? I mean, it was absolutely crazy. And he came out and said, look, we are held accountable for our jobs. Players, if they play bad, they're benched. Coaches, if they coach bad and lose games, they're fired. Yet, referees can have poor performance after poor performance and face zero repercussions. 
Something has to change. Look, everybody is at the game. Everybody is involved because you want to put the best product on the field. You have to do your job. Simply put, referees are not doing their job well, and they face zero consequence for that. Thank you, Jeremy Pruitt, for saying that in your media presser this week. It's time to hold referees accountable. And the fact that Pruitt came out and said it, you're my favorite coach in America. That is my bold statement for you. Let's look to week nine. Let's get some quick picks out here. Let's tell people who's going to win and what games are going down this week. And we're going to start with one of our surprise undefeated teams. The number 16th ranked Southern Methodist Mustangs are heading to Houston. What happens in this game? SMU keeps rolling. They're, they're playing great offensively, defensively, doing their job. Houston, ever since the whole kind of debacle, red shirt the redshirt deal. Red yeah, SMU continues the uh, undefeated streak. Yeah, I totally agree with you here. Houston redshirting like half their team. Dana Holgerson somehow getting away with it. SMU continues to roll. Some SEC action. Mississippi State going down to College Station to take on Texas A&M. A&M needs a win here. Miss State got rolled by LSU last weekend. Well, well Mississippi, Mississippi State has no offense. They, they, they are still looking for their identity, especially at the quarterback position. They just have no threat to throw the football. A&M, very good defense at home. Kellen Mon. Hopefully he continues to run the football. I think that's the key. You saw last week they started having more quarterback design runs. He started taking off more. So if he continues to use his legs, I like AM in this game. Yeah, I would agree with you here. Mississippi State just unimaginative on offense, not creative whatsoever, very predictable as well. AM should get the win yep. at home. In the Big Ten, Maryland is heading to Minnesota. Minnesota undefeated, ranked number 17. Maryland kind of been Jekyll and Hyde all season. Yep. Which team is Minnesota going to get? Um, Jekyll, hi, yeah. whatever one's the worst one. Which one's the worst you can one? choose. Whatever. Not good, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to go Minnesota. Tanner Morgan, quarterback, and I had the opportunity to cover Minnesota when they played Fresno State, and uh, nothing is going to wow you from an arm standpoint. I mean, he's not going to, he doesn't have a rocket, but smart, knows where to go to the football, very accurate. He's about 66, 67% completion right now. He's a, he's a good game manager, and they're playing well on defense, and right now, uh, Maryland's offense is just like, it's a roller yeah. coaster. You just don't know what you're going to get any day. So I, I like Minnesota to keep it going just because they've been more consistent playing good football on both sides. Yeah, Minnesota hasn't really had to face any sort of strength of schedule. But P.J. Fleck and this team is turning into one of the feel-good stories of 2019. They'll keep it rolling at yeah. home this weekend and stay undefeated. In the ACC, a great rivalry on the hard court. We'll look at the gridiron this week. Duke heading to Chapel Hill to take on the Fighting Mac Rounds in UNC. Duke got absolutely rolled and whooped up on by Virginia last week. What's going to happen here? UNC, Sam Howell, he's, he's a true freshman. Has had a tremendous freshman year. He's getting better and better. Had a great game last week. I think in two overtimes, three overtimes versus Virginia Tech. I think through five touchdowns. So I like him and his progress. I think they get this one done at home. I have to agree with you. We're agreeing a lot. But Duke is just not looking good right now. Coach Cutcliffe having a hard time with that team. Look for UNC to get the win at home. Southern Cal is heading up to Colorado to take on Mel Tucker and those Buffaloes. Colorado looked pretty good earlier in the season. LaVisca Chanel, one of the better playmakers in all of college football. USC, speaking of Jekyll and Hyde, you just don't know what you're going to get. What happens? Well, well, Slovis is back at quarterback. Four touchdowns the past two games, no interceptions. So you, you, hopefully you get some more consistency from that position from USC. And then Colorado, 13 points total the last two games. I mean, their offense since the beginning of the year, has just been going downhill. Yeah, downhill quickly. Fast. So I, I like USC. I like the quarterback play. I like the receivers. They got playmakers. Colorado, I mean, they got a great playmaker, but just no one to get him the ball at the moment. So I, I like USC to win this one. Yeah, you, you see USC success when they fling it around the field, yep. man. When you get that quarterback and shotgun and let him get it to those playmakers, they put points What's on the board. that run-and-shoot offense? Yeah. Got, uh, offense, and, 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 and they have plenty of receivers. I think there's probably, in my opinion, a top five receiving core in the country. Tons of speed, tons of height, the guys that can go up that go up there and kind of win those 50-50 balls. Another Pac-12 battle, Oregon, who's looking really good right now, number 11 in the nation, is going to be at home welcoming in Mike Leach and the Washington State Cougars. Speaking of a team that really can't find it on offense, I mean, or defense, this could be a long game for Washington State. I, I think it is going to be Oregon right now. I think they're just – they understand that if they want to get to where they want to get to, and that's the playoffs – they can't have any more slip-ups. They had that one start the year off versus Auburn. Now it's, hey, we got to go every single week. And it's not just about winning, but the games we should win, we must dominate. It's it's kind of the sexy points now, too, with them as well. Yeah. So I think they go in there at home feeling good, especially after last week's big win versus Washington. 
and uh, it's a route in my opinion. Some call them style points. Aaron Murray calls them sexy, sexy points. points. That could <laughs> be important for a matchup in the Big Ten, a team that is looking sexy. Penn State, number six in the nation, is going to head up to East Lansing and take on Michigan State. Now, Michigan State has not been very good whatsoever on offense, but you know they've got a solid defense. They're going to slow the game down, and they need to slow down. Penn State's offense because KJ Hamler is a bona fide All American. He is a total stud. Any chance for a letdown here? Penn State had a great emotional win night whiteout game against Michigan. Well, the, last the week. things that travel are defense, and Penn State's been playing great defense. Michigan State, no offense at all. I mean, like 23 points a game. They don't turn the football over. I'm talking about Penn State here. So, all the things that that you want when you go on the road, you have. And plus, you have a ton of confidence based on the way you played this year. I like Penn State. I, I said a few weeks ago, I mean, they haven't played anyone, so I don't know how good they are. Well, the, these past couple of weeks, they've proven that this is a pretty darn good football team, really well coached. I think they go in there with a lot of confidence. Like I said, they do all the little things right, and that's the kind of that's what you want to see on a, on a tough road game. Yeah, it is a tough road game, and it's interesting because you come off that emotional win. You know, Michigan scored late to make it look closer than it actually was. They win by eight points. And then East Lansing, this is not going to be the most raucous environment. So does Penn State really have to get dialed in to know, guys, we have to pick this up and keep it rolling? We're the number six ranked team in the nation right now. College football playoffs, legitimate chance for them. Oh, it definitely is. And there's a target on their back. Yeah. I mean, Michigan State saying, listen, we can right all the wrongs that have happened this season right now if we win this game. So I think for them, they are a good football team, returning a lot of starters from the previous season, a lot of guys that have pride. Uh, on the name on the front and back of their jersey. So they're coming after them. And if Penn State falls asleep even a little bit, just like Wisconsin did last week, and, and, and they could slip up. I'm not saying if Penn State is going to roll this game. I think it's going to be a very good game. And, and, and Michigan State does have a chance. I just if, if Penn State does their job and plays a B-plus, A-minus game, they'll win this thing. Yeah, just can't turn the ball over, yeah. and they haven't been, so yes. you'd have to lean towards Penn State here. Speaking of a team that Penn State just beat up on last week, Michigan, they, like, must win yes. this game for Coach Harbaugh. They're welcoming in number eight Notre Dame into the big house. And, and, I mean, where is Michigan right now? When you look at Shea Patterson in the pocket, and if he gets any pressure, he freaks out and turns the ball over. I said it on this show last week. I said if Shea Patterson doesn't turn the ball over – Penn State might lose this game. What do you think Shea Patterson did? He threw a pick, man. He I turns the you, ball over. I told you he would, though. Big game here for Michigan. Notre Dame, again, talk about a team that could right some wrongs. I if you beat an upset Notre Dame, you, you sort of really help it, out it's Jim like, it's, been like a big, it's like a slow death right now for Jim yes. Harbaugh. It really is. And I just think guys on that football team, they're just they're not buying in into, into it anymore. The let's just eat steak and drink milk mentality, I think, is <laughs> over with. Like it has been preached, it's been said. Yeah. And it was cool at first. And now guys are like, coach, it doesn't matter. We're not winning football games. Exactly. Like, we'll eat some chicken if we can win some football games. It's <laughs> yeah. fine. Like, yeah. Let's do something we'll else. We'll go plant based if we can win some we football games. We can't win against a top 10 team or top 15 team. I just don't see it happen. I think this team right now based on what we've seen from this year. And you know, you're part of teams sometimes when things aren't going well and the leadership has to step up. Right now, no one on Michigan stepping up from a leadership standpoint. Ian Book, I like him a lot. I like the defense for Notre Dame. They've proven that they can play with the big boys this year. So I think Notre Dame wins. And this is, I think now this is really the beginning of the end possibly for Jim Harbaugh. Interesting, yeah. Brian Kelly, I was looking up his career record as a head coach, Central Michigan, Cincinnati. Uh, Notre Dame. I mean, his overall record as a head coach is seriously impressive. I think Notre Dame continues to keep it rolling. A game that we had circled a couple weeks ago that was supposed to be gigantic this weekend took a bit of a hit as Wisconsin lost at Illinois last weekend. But number 13, Wisconsin, is heading to number three, Ohio State. Can this defense that has looked so good minus one game slow down Justin Fields and the Buckeyes? Well, I think the key is obviously defense, and the other key is going to be Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. Can you run the football, and can you keep the offense off the field? I mean, that's a great way to do it, win the time of possession. So for Wisconsin, the goal is going to be kind of get around 34 to 35 minutes of possession time. Wow. And that's just pound it, pound it, pound it, pound it, pound it. See if you can wear down Ohio State. The thing is, Ohio State's really good on defense. <laughs> yeah, they so are. So this isn't going to be easy for them to get it going. But if they can get the big guy going a little bit early, get him some confidence, wear out the defense, keep Justin Fields on offense off the field, I think that's how you win this football game. Because if you want to go punch for punch, 
versus this offense, you're not going to win. No. Justin Fields and, and all those guys on that side of the football, offensive lines played really well this season. Great running back, great receivers, a lot of confidence. That's not how you win this football game. So defense is going to have to step up, maybe get a turnover, strip yeah, sack. Yeah. Uh, and then offensively, you're going to have to just eat clock. So I don't think you want to be in any kind of fast paced offense. I think it's run the football, get in the huddle, slow play it, hike the ball about 10 seconds to go on the play clock, and just keep doing that over and over again and see if you can control the game. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. Wisconsin, what they've done so well all year long is maintain time of possession, but then score on defense or special teams. If they're able to do that, watch out. This game could be closer than most people think. And we have a top 10 matchup to round out this week on Campus Lore Live. Number nine, Auburn is heading to Baton Rouge to take on number two, LSU. If you remember, Auburn went to the swamp and Bo Nix looked like a freshman. If he looked like that in the swamp, what is he going to look like in Death Valley? Oh, yeah, 11 for 27, three picks in the swamp. Yeah. I mean, wait, listen, that, that was a good learning experience for him, and and Florida's defense is, is a lot better than, than LSU's defense. So I, I like LSU in this game. I love Joe, Joe Burrow. I think he's going to get it done. Um, Auburn has a great defense. I mean, one of the best defenses and, and probably the best defense in the SEC. It's just that's a lot of firepower, and I can see, just like we talked about the previous game, I can see some turnovers from Auburn's offense. I can see a pick here or there, yep. a fumble. Booby Whitlow's still out, so you're missing your top running back. That's not a good thing when you're on the road with a freshman quarterback. So LSU wins this game just for the fact that I just don't have, still don't have a lot of confidence in Auburn's offense at the moment that they can go on the road in a hostile environment and get it done Yeah, like, without their top running back. Like Coach O said, Death Valley is where opponents' dreams come to die. And I feel like Auburn is going to be running into a bit of a buzzsaw this weekend. That offense, Joe Burrow, I mean, he's our Heisman favorite right now. Probably going to be the number one pick in the NFL draft. I don't know and, if he uh, wants to go to Miami. Joe yeah. Brady has these guys playing at a super high level. So I would think either way, if they try to slow the game down, LSU can beat him. And if they want to go tit for tat, watch out because LSU is liable to put up about 50-plus yep. on Auburn. Should be a fascinating week. Big thanks to Devin White and Jerry Tillery for joining us, and we look forward to you joining us next week right here on Campus Lore Live. For Aaron, I'm Drew. We'll see you then.